Talk with Mike Florio. All right, we'll attempt to get Mike on the line here shortly. Uh, just to kind of bring you up to speed, uh, there is a report out on TMZ that uh, former uh, linebacker Junior Seau uh, is dead. And we have no other details other than the police are on the scene. I guess it's in California. We know he's had a history of some issues uh, when he had the car accident and claimed he fell asleep. And so we don't know anything more about that. We'll try to bring you up to speed uh, with any details that we have. Mike Flurry, our ProFootballTalk.com. Mike, very busy day. Thanks for joining us. Do you feel like the Saints players will win in appeal and lessen their suspensions? I, I just don't know. I, I don't anticipate that Roger Goodell is going to change his own mind. He's taken more time, far more time, to come up with the suspensions than he had with the, the non-player punishments, and the appeal will go back to Roger Goodell. I think the more intriguing thing is to keep an eye on what legal avenues the players may have beyond Roger Goodell. Several weeks ago, there was a lawsuit filed by a couple of Broncos players who were suspended for violation of either the steroids or the substance abuse policy. I think it was the steroids policy. And it's a very narrow window to try to challenge the result of an arbitration. And, look, this is an arbitration that's going to be held under a collective bargaining agreement that the union and the league agreed to just last August. So they can't say that this is an inherently flawed process when they agreed to continue to do it, where Roger Goodell has final authority over the the appeals of uh, of these suspensions that he's imposed. Well, I I I am totally okay with you know the the suspensions except for the Vilma. Now they say the coaches should be held to a higher standard. Now why would you suspend Vilma? Okay, put ten thousand dollars on Favre's head. Okay, but why is he on even ground with Sean Payton? Well, it wasn't just Favre. It was also Kurt Warner. That's part of the announcement today by the NFL that the ten thousand dollars was on the table for both of those games. And there may be other evidence we don't know about, but it does seem like an extremely harsh penalty. I don't know whether the game here, and and I don't mean to imply that the NFL is treating it as a game, but the strategy here could be to hit them hard and then reduce the, the penalties through the appeal process so it does look meaningful. Reduce it down to eight games, for example. Then it looks like Roger Goodell is willing to, to hear arguments and, and change his mind. But if he does that, he ends up looking wishy-washy. So I don't know that there's ever a good way out of this, this box that you put yourself in when you're the person who makes the decision and also renders the appeal. If you, if you uphold what you do, it looks like a waste of time. And if you reduce what you do, it looks like you can't make a decision. Now, explain this one to me. You know, he talks about that the, what the Saints are doing. It, it hurts the integrity of the game. He wants to protect the shield. And we know it's about protecting the players. But then you have Spy, Spygate with Bilicek, which I think more than the Saints thing, that it goes against integrity of the shield. Why would they be – why is he so much more, you know, strict and so so heavy over here when it was a fine and a first-round draft pick over here, which I think that was more integrity than, you know, the Saints? Because this – directly related to the safety of the players and at a time when the NFL is seeing more and more former players file lawsuits every day as a result of a career's worth of concussions and there's this unprecedented move by the NFL to make the game safer if you're talking about any incentive to deliberately injure players that's the kind of thing that is going to be met with harsh punishment also as a practical matter the NFL investigated this back in early 2010, and I personally don't believe the NFL wanted to catch the Saints then. I don't think the NFL likes to stand up and say we have cheaters. Well, if the Saints had just quit doing it, nothing else ever would have happened. But the Saints kept doing it for two more years, and I think part of these punishments come from the fact that the Saints didn't quit while they were ahead. Now, I think that, that helps explain the punishments against the non-players, but this is viewed as a significantly serious situation that the players involved are going to get hit hard a lot of players mike are coming out in defense of their the players that got suspended uh reggie bush lamar woodley and they're all taking the uh i guess the direction that they're over policing the game where do you stand on these suspensions do you think it's over the well, top yeah here's the thing 
and, and this is, I think, some of the argument that we're going to hear in the appeal process, that there's no clear connection between the offer to pay money and the actual infliction of injury. Now, Brett Favre may beg to differ the way he got banged around in the 2009 NFC Championship game, but there was only one player ever carted off in any of the three seasons that this was going on, and that was Reggie Bush when he was playing for the Saints. He broke his leg trying to field a punt against the 49ers. So either the players were ignoring the offer or they just weren't able to, to do what they were trying to do. And that's where I think there needs to be a disconnect in this process here. You know, the, the men who funded this pool, where the incentive was to inflict injury, providing the incentive and acting on the incentive are two different things. And that, that may explain why Vilma was nailed for helping provide the incentive. And, you know, I think only one player was punished, and that's Anthony Hargrove, for acting on the incentive. So that, that I, I don't really, you know, I, I think a year seems like too much for Vilma. But I, would, I just hope all the facts come out at some point so we're assessing it based on what actually was discovered and not on some type of, you know, secondhand information, incomplete bits and pieces. I want to know exactly what the NFL based this on before I can make any firm conclusions about whether or not it was the right thing to do. All right, Mike. Well, I think it's, this may be, we've, it's been reported. We saw it. Don't know the truth behind it yet, but Junior Seau found dead. Have you heard anything yeah, more, about that? Yeah, there are more and more reports coming out about that now. Um, it started with TMZ, which a lot of people are going to be inherently skeptical about. But the North County Times, one of the newspapers out in the San Diego area, is now reporting that he died of a, a apparently self-inflicted gunshot wound to the chest. So, oh, boy. you know, it, uh, it's still not completely confirmed, but it, it, it looks like a tragic situation. And, and this is going to continue the debate over whether and to what extent the uh, – um, the brain injury, you know, the history of concussions is contributing to depression and and other other long term health problems, and uh, you know it's not an issue that's going to go away anytime soon. But even with all that, with all with everything that's happened in the past, there were 253 players drafted this weekend, hundreds more signed as free agents, and players are not walking away from football because of this yet. They may at some point, but they're not doing it yet. Now tell me this now you know because the 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 first problem was that they were saying the NFL had information that they were hiding from them so they could sue them but from today forward people knowing and the NFL putting the information out there you can't really sue at this point for things like that now can you Well the issue now would be has, has the NFL done enough to protect and is the NFL doing enough to protect which ties into the, the bounty punishments this is if anybody sues now for things that have happened since the NFL has fully revealed everything there is to know about concussions, if you're the NFL, you point to the way that they responded to the bounty situation, and, and that will, I think, uh, undercut that argument. But, you know, one of the arguments for the players who have filed suit based on past concussions claiming that the NFL hid information, I think one of the arguments from the NFL is going to be, look, even if we had told you guys everything there was to know, you would have kept on playing, and the best evidence of that is even today – players keep on playing now that they know. Talking to Mike Flurry or ProFootballTalk.com here in the Big Show. I'll wrap you up with something on the field. Uh, Browns draft Whedon, get him in the first round. Maybe they reach, but uh, McCoy now seems to be kind of the odd man out, although, you know, if they're not going to get anything for him right now, they're going to have to hang on to him. Uh, what do you think is going to shake out with that situation? Get rid of him. you got to get rid of McCoy. The one thing that drives me crazy is when a team feels strongly enough about a quarterback, they use a first-round pick on him, and then they turn around and say, we're going to have an open competition, and the best man's going to play. Look, unless it's a rigged competition where they're just trying to prop up the guy's confidence, the rookie's confidence, by saying, hey, congratulations, you won the competition. You know, they don't want him to be soft and complacent. I, I don't like the idea of giving Colt McCoy an opportunity to be the starter in Cleveland or Matt Moore or David Garrard the opportunity to be the starter in Miami. Trust the guy. If you didn't trust the guy, you wouldn't use the first-round pick because if folks in Cleveland know full well what happens when a guy gets put in that job, assuming he's going to get benched at some point so he's not holding the ball as tight, he's not worried about every incomplete pass, when am I going to get the hook? He assumes he's going to get the hook at some point. You relax and you end up having a pretty good season like Derek Anderson did five years ago, and then that creates a huge mess that you never <laughs> recover from. Thanks, Mike. Great insight. Appreciate it. All right. See you guys. Thanks. Mike Florio, ProFootballTalk.com. And let's 
I'll be honest, Whedon has a very uh, small window, small future. The future is now for <laughs> yes. Brandon Whedon. 